welcome to the Perkins and Metzenberg Lecture. Um, it's my um, pleasure to give the introduction to this lecture. And before I introduce John Taylor, I just wanted to say a few words about David Perkins and Bob Metzenberg. David Perkins was a neurospora geneticist that spent most of his time working at Stanford University. He's well known for his work on cytogenetics, chromosomal aberrations, and population genetics. He's responsible for a deposition of over 5,000 strains to the Fungal Genetics and the Stock Center. And he was a member of the National Academy. Bob Metzenberg was also a member of the National Academy. This picture is when he was being awarded the Thomas Hunt Morgan Medal from the GSA. And uh, he worked at the, did most of his career at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Bob was interested in the regulation of metabolism, understanding molecular mechanisms of that process. And in later years, he worked on uh, meiotic gene silencing, which you heard about today. And he also uh, helped with uh, Eric Selker, who did a postdoc in his laboratory, uh, defining the function of RIP. So uh, John Taylor um, is uh, its really a great pleasure to introduce John Taylor. Just to tell you a little bit about uh, John Taylor's productivity over the past uh, few years. <laughs> First, he's a AAAS fellow. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. He was um, uh, elected as a distinguished mycologist in the Mycological Society, um, Mycological Society of America. He was also president of MSA and was also president of the International Mycological Society. Um, he has close to uh, over 200 publications and has been cited collectively over those publications over 50,000 times, which is quite an accomplishment. So um, just to give you a little bit of uh, history of John. So he was a really cute kid. <laughs> and he has been a lifelong Boy Scout. Um, and that has really contributed, I think, to his love of nature and his uh, really uh, naturalist um, uh, excellence. He did his graduate work at UC Berkeley, so he has a little bit more hair in here, really cute also. Uh, and then he went to graduate school at UC Davis where he met his significant other, Delia Taylor, who's here today. Welcome, Delia. And she's a, a distinguished naturalist in her own right. She's very involved in the California Native Plant Society and is a past president of that organization. John then went and, and at UC Davis, uh, John worked on a basidiomycete morphological characterization with Bulleri. He then went to the University of Georgia where he worked on chytridium morphology and then began his professorship in 1980 at UC Berkeley where he rose through the ranks from assistant to associate to full to off scale to off off scale um, and had a lot of fun along the way. So this is his colleague Tom Bruns in the department dressing up uh, for a party. Um, with uh, Nick Reed at the University of Edinburgh, where he gave the plenary section at the International Mycological Congress, and at Lima Tour, where we always have a party every year. Um, so John, as I told you, at, what, did a lot of morphology for his graduate and postdoc work, but when he came to Berkeley, he uh, developed a friendship with Tom White, and this has really been um, a, a changing aspect of fungal biology because Tom White was involved in Cetus and Roach where he developed PCR and John talked him into using that technology to understand um, fungal phy phylogeny, ecology, and evolution. And these are just some uh, very important uh, papers from all that work where uh, John used, to in collaboration with Tom, used DNA to ask questions about fungal biology. So there are a number of questions that, um, from my perspective, have really obsessed John over the years. And one of those is, what is a fungal species? And so using, using these tools to really determine whether how morphology correlates with genome, how uh, mating strategies correlate with genome. And as you'll notice down here, this is a, um, a PNAS paper that John um, published where he looked at uh, cryptic speciation in uh, Aspergillus flatus, and that was communicated by Bob Metzenberg. John is also interested in whether uh, asexual fungi have cryptic sex. It was thought for a long time that there were lineages of asexual fungi that never did sex. John showed that that was not true using his molecular markers. And one of his favorite organisms is coccidioides and revealed cryptic sex looking at recombination of these markers. And again, this was communicated by David Perkins. Finally, more recently, what is the molecular basis of adaptation? He really has pioneered the use of population genomics in our field to address these questions of how uh, populations diverge over time and undergo speciation. 
So, um, oops. So uh, John has had a large number of colleagues in progeny, both his uh, personal progeny here, but also his uh, progeny of uh, his colleagues who all have to wear uh, petri dishes on their heads, uh, go out for forays. This is a coccidioides workshop, and uh, many of you here are members of this community who have launched their own um, productive careers, understanding basic aspects of fungal biology. He also has done a tremendous amount of teaching and service. This is a, a MSA, um, drops you in your tracks, and so he's very been very active in MSA, building up that organization, um, but also teaching. You can see here he's dressed up for teaching, takes his students to interesting places and forays. So what are the personal aspects that I'm really grateful for John in terms of um, uh, helping me in my career and also what I think are really important to many of us in terms of his career? He's an evolutionary biologist by, by interest, but he's obsessed with fungi. And that's really great for us because he could work on anything, but he chose to understand these evolutionary concepts and questions using fungi. He also is fearless and visionary. So when people go into his office or talk to him at meetings and talk to him about a potential project, he asks not why do you want to do this, but why not? And that's really uh, a liberating um, uh, attitude to talk to somebody that has that kind of perspective. He also is generous and collaborative in his multiple publications on multiple different fungi. is really unique, I think, in, this, in, our fungal, in our community. He's endlessly optimistic, which is also really great. And finally, he enjoys his work and his life both immensely. So, John? <laughs> committee and I want to thank the chairs and I want to thank Louise for that very kind introduction I think there's time for questions <laughs> so <laughs> this is quite an honor and I realized this afternoon I didn't have a title and so I thought I would use the title that uh, title hearkening back to the first talk at this meeting Arturo's talk about stochasticity and chance and stochasticity and deter determinism. And the reason is that I think, I think much of life is shaped by chance. My career certainly has been. And so I'm gonna use this coin as a little marker of where I think it's a particularly good piece of luck has happened, as if you flipped a coin and it came up heads. But it isn't all chance. And so as Pasteur observed, um, in the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. And there are times when it is very useful to have a prepared mind. Now, Louise, Louise mentioned that um, I was a Boy Scout, and that's true. Um, and I want to first mention this guy, Mike Robbins, who was my sister's high school math teacher, and who recruited me to become a Boy Scout counselor. And I did that every summer when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley. And when I started out, I was going to be a physics major, and by the end, I was going to be a biology major. And the reason was I had to take a class to learn the plants because I was going to start to teach nature meripage. And I couldn't believe how much fun it was and how easy it was for me compared to physics. <laughs> <laughs> and I also learned that I like to teach. And so that made me think, maybe, maybe I should go to grad school. But I, it was late in the game. I was a senior, going to be a senior. And I thought I'd better find out what research is like. So I went to this guy, Ralph Emerson, who was one of the great mycologists of his era, member of the National Academy. And I went to his office and he looked at me and he said, no, I'm too busy. And then he looked at me again and kind of sighed and went, okay, come back next week. <laughs> so I came back next week and he set me on a, on a project that I was interested in. There are plants in the Sierra Nevada that, that are actually parasites on fungi. They have no chlorophyll and they behave like fungi. And so I wanted to study them. And, he helped me do that. Um, he set me with a postdoc who taught me how to do micro technique uh, for light microscopy. So I liked microscopy, and so when I went to grad school 
at uh, UC Davis. I could have been a plant taxonomist or I could have studied fungi. And this, my mentor here, Ken Wells, was a great, solid mentor. He let me struggle with a useless project for a year <laughs> before my own project, before suggesting, maybe you want to try something else, and I've got a well-funded project you might want to do, which was electron microscopy of nuclear division. And that work got me to the Second International Mycological Congress, where I met two people. The first one, Manfred Gerbart. Those of you who are cell biologists will know him. Um, he was the great god of cell, of fungal cell biology, and they, he was allowed to come to the meeting and got to speak with him. But I also met Mel Fuller, and Mel offered me a postdoc based on the poster that I had there. And so that was another piece of luck. So then I went home um, back to Davis and said, talked to my girlfriend and said, I've got this offer to go to Georgia, would you want to come with me? And she said, I'd be happy to, John, but not as your girlfriend. <laughs> So we got married. <laughs> and then we went to Georgia, and I had another piece of luck. Delia got a job in one of the first labs to ever try to transform plants with DNA, Rich Meager's lab in genetics at Georgia. And I would go up there for lunch, and it didn't take me long to realize that if I was interested in studying fungal evolution, studying DNA directly was going to be a lot more useful than studying electron microscopy and trying to compare things. And so I, I did the electron mi microscope work with Fuller, and Fuller was a great mentor too. He let me write a grant proposal to do more electron microscopy, and I think that helped me get a job at Berkeley. So this is the chair of Berkeley Botany at the time I got my job. And I got the job, and then I heard through the rumor mill that following summer that the dean of biology at Berkeley had taken the job back from Botany, and I didn't have a job. And so I called up Ray Collins and I said, you know, I've heard this rumor, what do you, what's the truth? And he said, don't worry, John, I've got it covered. And he did it, he beat the dean. So I got a job. And alas, when I got back to Berkeley, my undergrad mentor, Ralph Emerson, had succumbed to lung cancer. But his um, field lived on in the form of a couple of graduate students, one of whom was Don Napley. And Don was great because Don was everything I wasn't. He understood biochemistry, he understood fungal physiology. And if I was interested in working on DNA, I was going to have to learn that. And so I talked with Don and together we decided it would be a great idea to, uh, to advance that, but he had to finish his thesis first. And you may, not, you may not know, but Don is a very avid bike rider. And he was so avid that he took welding to learn how to make his own frames. And the welding equipment came in very handy because the results from his thesis were so hot that he had to wear them as he typed it up. <laughs> and, and I want you to notice that that's a typewriter. So Ray Collins plays another part in the story. He informed me about three weeks before the start of the quarter that, that as the most junior faculty member, I was in charge of the year's seminar series. And then he added, and there's no budget. <laughs> so I got catalogs from every institution within 50 miles of Berkeley, no internet then, and poured over them and, and picked botanists and mycologists within a 50 mile radius. Sent letters, made phone calls, and one person who responded was David Perkins, whom I didn't know. So he came to Berkeley, and this is another time that Coin came up heads. He gave a talk on strains of Neurosper from nature. And I still remember sitting next to Don Natvig in 2040, the old lecture hall in Life Science Building. And when we saw that, we turned to each other, that's the fungus we're going to work on. Because he had strains. <laughs> and this was the first paper that we published and that Georgiana May is in the corner there. She was a master's student, got a master's at Georgia, and then came to Berkeley to be my first grad student. And the paper we did was on the smallest pieces of DNA possible, mitochondrial DNA plasmids. And we thought this was the most wonderful thing we'd ever done. And David Perkins had just been elected to the National Academy. So we sent it to him. And he wrote the nicest rejection letter I've ever gotten. <laughs> and it started out, Dear John and Don, I don't think I've ever done anything of such significance as to deserve publication in the proceedings of the National Academy. 
So we sent it to J Bacteriology. <laughs> and you look at the acknowledgments of these early papers and you see who really helped you. So we couldn't get DNA out of Neurospin. We followed Lamb Lewis's protocol perfectly, too perfectly as it turns out. So we went to St. Louis and watched him, and what they called grinding buffer was really post-grinding buffer. That simple difference let us get all the DNA we could handle. We met Rick Collins there, who worked on plasmids, and just discovered plasmids in Neurosper mitochondria. And we stayed with Delia's brother, with my brother-in-law, Wayne Barnes, who was an expert in nucleic acid biology, and we learned a lot from him, too. I put this this one in for two reasons. And the first one is it shows you where you can publish when a field is new. So it's an axiom of evolutionary biology that three species trees are uninformative. Each one is equally related to the other. You need four species to ask a question. Is A closer to B or closer to C? But we published a three species tree. <laughs> <laughs> one branch was non-existent. <laughs> And it says in the legend, unaided inspection, parsimony analysis, or compatibility analysis would give you the same answer. Well, duh, it would have to. <laughs> but this was the first time we got to thank David Perkins for pro providing strains. This was the apex of our work with mitochondrial plasmids. We got a paper into nature. It didn't start a new <laughs> field of inquiry. Now, this is an important coin that came up heads. This is Tom White, when he was chief scientific officer at CEDIS, one of the first, or maybe the first startup, certainly in the Bay Area, biotech startup. And he'd gotten a PhD with Alan Wilson, the evolutionary biologist. And then he went to Wisconsin and was a postdoc with Julian Davies. And then he came back to Berkeley because he was in love with the poet, Leslie Scalapino, whom he married, and got a job at CEDIS, started to help start CEDIS. This is a letter he wrote to me in 1982, and I'm going to enlarge it. We heard that he was working, that he was working on turning cellulose into sugar. Sound familiar? And Cetus had a, had a grant for that. And he had cloned um, a fungal ribosomal gene from a bacidiomycete just for the fun of it. And he came and gave a presentation. And then we talked about it, and he said that his technician, Shirley Kwok, who had done the cloning, uh, could help with, with DNA hybridization to try to address um, a, a question about red algae. And what question was that? So the Belgians, Belgian, um, had, a, had a hypothesis that red algae were closer relatives of ascomycetes than any other fungi. And so I, here are the two possibilities. Dogma, green algae and red algae are distant to the fungi, and Demoland's idea that red algae are closer to ascomycota. So I went down to the bay, and I got some ulva and some what was then called gigartna and gave them to Shirley. <clears throat> and I'm going to enlarge this. So if you use the basidiomycete probe against basidiomycetes, ascomycetes, or zygomycetes, you got fairly good inferred percent hybridization. But if you use them against green or red algae, you got very low. So red algae were no closer than green algae. So we could reject Demoland's hypothesis. This paper didn't start in your field either. It's actually 22 times. <laughs> so now I want to introduce Tom Bruns. Um, this is Tom at the party for his PhD graduation. His mentors are on the left, Wes Brown and Jeff Palmer, and then other mycologists at uh, Michigan University of Michigan, Fogel and Schaefer on the right. This is, however, a better picture of Tom in those days. You'll note he does not have a typewriter. He's got a Corona portable PC. You need to do weight training to carry this around. But he, he and I had met a few years before, and when he was through, he wrote an NSF proposal and came to Berkeley with his own postdoc money. Now, I also want to introduce Steve Lee. Steve is under the asterisk here. And he was, he was um, part of our team, and he was also part of another team, the Ultimate Frisbee team. And you look at this picture, I looked at it and thought, why is Steve the only guy with his shirt off? <laughs> and then I realized, I was a young once, you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, they're going to take the team photo, maybe I'll take my shirt off. Then you look at Steve and go, no, I'm going to leave it on. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the second time uh, I had a, well, actually more than that, but this is when Tom White sent me a fax 
Now, I was, I was in Australia. Everyone in Australia had a fax machine. There was one on the Berkeley campus. And when he got there, I guess he sent it from Cetus. And um, in it, I, okay, I was in Australia because as soon as Tom Bruns came, I gave him the keys to the lab and went on sabbatical for a year. That's a very good strategy, as it turns out. And so Tom White said, um, Cetus has given me a year to do a sabbatical. I have something you're going to like. I want to come to the lab. So I faxed um, Tom Bruns in the chair of the department. I said, do whatever he wants. And Tom Bruns faxed back, I already have. <laughs> So what Tom White brought is in this slide, and I'm going to sort of show you the two people that matter in this slide, are Kerry Mullis, who was an employee at CETUS, and Tom White, who was boss of the team that included Kerry that got PCR to work. And this is the night that Kerry got California Scientist of the Year, and the next year he got a slightly bigger prize. And so that led to a publication that Berkeley wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't count for tenure for anyone, uh, a contribution to a volume that one of the authors is the editor of. And, uh, but what it, in, what it had in it was primers to amplify ribosomal regions and the protocol on how to do it. And 20 years after that paper, we got together and had a photo taken in 2009. And at that time, there were 10,000 citations of that paper, 2009. Now it's been cited 26,000 times. And so, and, and the increase is due to ecology. You know, it was sort of about to peter out for phylogeny, and then ecology came along. It's, it's, you know, its days are over, but it was a good run. <laughs> and I need to mention Mary Burby. And it looks here like Mary just fell into a pond and is sitting next to a fire to try to dry out. <laughs> but the truth is, her mom dropped, dropped the photo in the sink, so. <laughs> and, What's wrong with this photo is it doesn't show Mary's coffee cup, which is always half a liter, and she always has it in one of her hands. I think it's probably down below the edge of the photo. And it was Mary who thought about adding geologic time to the phylogenetic studies. And this is the first of the trees that we published, and we published a bunch, and she's published more, and many other people have published it. And that concept of geologic, geologic time and fungi has spawned many uh, research programs in many other people's labs. It's been very useful. This is probably within the error bar of the model. <laughs> error bars are big. Now, I want to come back to Louis Pasteur and the prepared mind. So when, we, when PCR came to the lab, we, uh, um, we were prepared. We'd spent 10 years working on mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial plasmids. We knew what the sequencing was possible. And so our first thought was NIH. And so time was short, the deadline was coming up, and Delia drove over to the UCSF Med School bookstore and bought John Rippon's third edition of Medical Mycology. And I just went through it and highlighted everywhere there was a controversy. And actually the highlighting had faded, I had to redo it for this slide. And, and so here, thus, the, thus we have a fungus, Coccidioides imidis, that has characteristics of a zygomycete in its parasitic stage and is gymnoascaceous ascomycete in its saprophytic stage. The problem will be fully settled only when the teleomorph state of C. imidis is found. Well, um, it turns out that, that uh, other people have prepared minds. This is Rita Svilgelis and his wife about that time. And Rita confided, confided to me some years later that he had submitted a grant, too, for the same idea, but he missed that deadline. That's worth another <laughs> <laughs> So that NIH grant that Tom White and I had, and we had NIH grants together for almost 20 years, hired Barbara Bowman, who had just graduated with a PhD from Alan Wilson at Berkeley. And so she asked and addressed that question, where is Coxie? And here's the tree from her, her, from her paper, and you can see it's in the middle of the ascomycota, so problem solved. And she wrote, DNA sequence should provide the characters that will lead to a unified, phylogenetically based classification system that embraces both sexual and asexual fungi. And truer words were never spoken, but it did take mycology about 23 years to, to actually implement. That publication caught the attention of John Galgiani, and I'm embarrassed that I don't have a young picture, picture of him when he was young. And he, he drove to Berkeley and then drove me to Fresno to attend my first coccidioides study group meeting. 
And for me, it was great because John Galgiani had cultures in, in his lab of Coxie. So that led to another grant proposal to study population uh, genetics of Coxie. And Austin Burt and Vaso Kofopano, evolutionary biologists from Santa Cruz, were attracted to that project. But my picture of Austin has Kathy Labulio, who was in the lab then working on penicillin, and her husband, John Royer, who was down the road at Stanford. And when I look at John Royer's picture, I always wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Has ever, anyone ever seen both of them in the same place at the same time? <laughs> I have. So Austin's first paper was on um, molecular markers that reveal cryptic sex. <coughs> and as Louise pointed out, we finally got David Perkins to submit a publication to, the, to PNAS. And this one, um, in this one he took he used anonymous markers and <clears throat> 25 strains and scrambled them in the computer. Actually, I think he did it by hand. To, no, he did the computer. To simulate what sex would do to that genotype, and then he put the observed, and it's no different than the distribution, so you knew that they were recombining. No one still knows how it has sex, but we know it does. <clears throat> and his wife, Vasa Kofopano, looked at speciation, and, and uh, she sequenced five regions and could see that what we thought was one species was really two species. And at the same time, Dee Carter and Takao Kasago were postdocs, and Dee had come from France, by, or from New Zealand by way of France, and Takao from Japan by way of Scotland, by way of Oklahoma. And they worked on histoplasma, and this is actually their second version of histoplasma, histoplasma. <laughs> it proved to have a much more complicated structure um, than coxie. And what was interesting about this paper, or this study, with Neurospor we could get strains from David Perkins or the Fungal Genetic Stock Center. With coxie we can get them from John Galgiani, but to get them from Histo, we had to contact people from all over the world. And that led to relationships that endure to this day. It was, it was really a wonderful thing. Now I'm going to shift from sort of this early history to uh, two stories about how this kind of population work or evolutionary work can lead to further studies. So here's Vasos, um, Vasos tree. And that attracted an, a zoologist who worked on worms to come and be a postdoc, Matt Fisher. Worms in rats, actually. And this is upon arrival. And this is after a year in the castle. <laughs> he came with his girlfriend, Ayala, Ayala um, Gill, and then they were married um, before they left and went back to the UK and had a child. Um, so Matt greatly extended the sampling that Vasa had done and found there were two species and named them. But I think even more significantly, he found populations in these species. And these populations, they, this work has been carried on especially by Bridget Barker um, at, uh, in Arizona. And that a lot more is known now, but this hasn't been disproved, I'm happy to say. And this empowered other work by other people. And this is Jeff Townsend and Hannah Johannesson. And both of them are remarkable for not aging. I don't know how they do that. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at concerted evolution of repeat units in a protein that Coxie makes to mislead um, the host. And what they found was that the terminal parts of, a, of the uh, repeated region, they behave, they evolve as any other gene. All, all, indivi all uh, individuals in the species stick together. So co the Arizona coxies in, in uh, pink and the uh, California one in green. But those in between are all mixed up because of un unequal crossing over. The other thing that those populations did was it gave a target for NIH when it was Sanger, they were going to Sanger sequence fungi. And so they paid Tiger to do one and the Bro to do 14 coxie species. And that enabled Jason Steitch and Tom Sharpton to bring us into the genomic age. <coughs> and this is their paper. And in it, <coughs> what they did was 
They had genomes of, what, nine, nine fungi. And they used a program, CAFE, to look through them and look for gene families that were either, um, had either become reduced in, the, in Coxy or expanded. So reduced first. So these are genes for enzymes that, that code for proteins that digest plants. And you can see the onigenales don't have any. So whereas most plants are, most fungi are vegetarian, not this group. And then if you look for the enzymes, the genes that code for enzymes that digest animal protein, you can see that the coxyclade has an excess of them. And so it has switched from being a vegetarian to being a, a carnivore. And it also, that was, those genomes also aided population genomics. This is Dan Musi and Bridget Barker from uh, Arizona led this paper. And the idea here was to put the genomes together so there would be several from Arizona and one from Cox, one, two from California, no, four from California. And you scan across the genome using a, a statistic that tells, talks about divergence. And they're well diverged, so the, the trace should be all the way at the top where the FST is almost one. But you can see there's a spot with the asterisk where it's down to nothing. In other words, both species had the same allele. So they had to be gene flow by hybridization and introgression. And this is, this is a cartoon that adds a few more sequences that Bridget Barker provided in her PhD work. And she noticed that sharp edge. And when you look there, there's a protein, there's a gene coding for a protein, one of these um, metalloproteinases. And it was in a group of genes that had been shown previously to be a virulence factor. So we went great. Using the, we know natural selection, drove that introgression, and we found a virulence factor and declared victory. And then Emily Whiston came along and did, transcript, did transcription comparisons between the fungus um, in its environmental phase and in its parasitic phase. And when she looked at MEP4, there was no change in transcription. She found a 99 amino acid region not known to be a gene between MEP4 and the edge of that hybridization block introgression block that was up fold 24 in the parasitic phase. No one's been able to knock it out to, to uh, see what it really does. Because when you knock it out, you'll also get MEP4, but I'm hoping someday someone can do that. So I showed a picture of John Galgiani earlier. And when I entered the Coxie field, this is, these are the guys that were there. And, and I don't have Mark Orbach here because he's too young for this slide. <laughs> and these guys are all older than me. And then I showed a picture of Bridget Barker, who, uh, who was declared by Jesse Uling early in the meeting as the new queen of Coxie. But I want to point out, there are pretenders to the throne. <laughs> <laughs> and so most of these people are from California. Bridget's from Arizona. Uh, Marichelle's from Baja, California. She's from California. And uh, um, Hung is from Texas. And Anna's from the CDC. And then I've learned recently that Paris Ham has uh, crashed. This is in her lower derby outfit. She's from New Mexico and studies Coxie now, and Jesse Uling is hoping to take Coxie to Oregon. Not, not the fungus, but studies of the fungus. <laughs> there are a few young men in the field. <laughs> so now I want to drop Coxie and go to Neurosper. And this is Jeremy Detman, who was a graduate student. And he was a graduate student at the same time as this guy. Now, how many people can recognize this guy from the back. Mm -hmm. It's Dave Jacobson, right? That's his lab picture, okay? But I have a picture of Dave <laughs> facing us. And this is a, a, a photo taken in the mid-2000s, probably, or maybe early 2000s. And right in the middle is Tim Zaro, who was a technician that was essential for both Tom Brenzis and my lab for a long time. But I'm going to just focus on the, on the Neurospora team here, Jeremy Depp and Dave Jacobs and Liz Turner and an undergraduate, Brianne Daniels. And I remember I mentioned that Dave Perkins uh, collected fungi from nature. Well, he didn't quit in 1976. He kept doing that through the 80s and into 2000s and reporting on them. And so, he, and when he brought these into the lab, he would make them with testers to identify them. So we thought we'd do him one better. Instead of just having testers, we'd make many crosses and many combinations. And this is Dave Jacobson's work. And so we took Crassa and Intermedia to do that. 
And when we did it, we could recover crass and intermediate and three new phylogenetic species. And when we compared those to phylogenies that Jeremy Detman made, the species recognition for the two was almost identical. And so we had focused on the matings that were good. So if you look at this, the, the black cells in the spreadsheet are the good matings, the ones that really worked. But Liz Turner was interested in the hybrids, the hybridizations between species that didn't work very well. And she noted that um, if, if the partners, one crass and one intermedia, were allopatric, they made a lot of ascospores, but they almost all died. And in some cases, if they were sympatric, the female could reject the intermedia partner, the wrong suitor, and still then mate with a crassa later. So she wanted to know if there were genes for that. She wanted to know if that had evolved. And so she, what she did was she crossed the two crasses, one that had the ability to reject um, the wrong suitor or a female mate choice, and the other one didn't. And then she mated them, the mate of those progeny back to the intermediates to see if they had which trait they had. When she did that, she got 11 QTL, 11 in the same direction for this ability of the female to, to recognize the wrong suitor. So that's enough to claim it's by natural selection and uh, reject neutral evolution. So it really did reinforce a reproductive barrier. And we think it was the first case of female mate choice in a microbe. Of course, it's a hermaphrodite, but it's a female role. So this same Jeremy Detman tree um, got used again when Rachel Bremen, Louise Glass, and I uh, dreamed about doing GWAS. And we thought we had a population here around the, um, the Gulf of Mexico. And when we had 50 transcriptomes, uh, Chris Ellison, who was a, in the lab, was a PhD student, made a tree, and we didn't have one population. So GWAS was out for a while. But we had two pops, two populations that were well sampled. The Louisiana was north of the one in the Caribbean, and it was in a colder environment. And so we, we were thinking about cold adaptation. And what Chris did then was the same thing that Neefsi had done. He lined up all the genomes, and he scanned through them, looking for regions of exceptional divergence. And highlighted in the middle is one of those, and then with the yellow is a gene in there that is a chaperone for cold-sensitive proteins like actin. And so um, we had a hypothesis then that that was, the, that was what drove the, um, the sweep through the population of this region and was involved in adaptation to cold. And we tested that by, um, this is the Neurospora knockout collection, thank you, Jay, um, that uh, we tested that by comparing wild type and the knockout, uh, strains with the wild type allele or the knockout allele, and their growth at 10 degrees as a fraction of their growth at 25. And you can see that um, these fungi don't like it cold, but they do a lot better if they have that prefoldum than if they don't. And because we started with the genome and then looked for the phenotype, we call it reverse ecology. Now, those 20 strains in Louisiana turned into 112 strains in Louise Glass's lab. And Louise, I'm obsessed with some things. Louise is obsessed with canidial signaling. And fortunately, Javi Palma Guerrero found that it was a variable trait in that, those, in that population of 112 from Louisiana. And so you could do genome-wide association. And uh, Rachel Brim's expertise came in here. And here was a, a one SNP in a calcium-sensing protein known from animals and yeast, another nice piece of luck, that then led Louise on, on, uh, on a research path that allowed her to elucidate a lot more information about uh, the genes involved in signaling and sensing, and, and uh, also led to um, her winning the Perkins Metzenberg, the, per the Metzenberg Award. So in this talk, I've talked about Perkins a lot, but I haven't said a thing about Bob Metzenberg. But I'm now going to change that. So this is Bob Metzenberg uh, sailing on a boat near the University of British Columbia. And here is Raju in the middle in Perkins' lab, but I'm not going to talk about Perkins. I'm going to talk about Louise Glass. <laughs> and she had some young pictures of me. Do that, too. <laughs> And the reason I've got them is that they were the authors of this paper in 1990. And you can see I've highlighted that they describe an efficient procedure 
for the isolation of heterothallic and homothallic <coughs> Sordariaceae from the soil. And what they found, so these are called gelasinospora, they're achinidial neurospora. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, now they would be called neurospora. And they're all homothallic, so they don't make Canadian, they're homothallic, you find them in soil. And I want, I mean, they're heterothallic, and you find them in soil. Now, I want you to think about that. You can tell you've got a neurospora because it makes those pink-orange Canadian culture. Or, if it's a homothallic, it makes parathesia. But what if it doesn't make either of those? Yeah, but hyphae, you don't know what it is. I want you to think about it. <clears throat> so, this is a tree that uh, Christina Nugren in Hanio Hassan's lab published, and it shows, we all focus on the canidial neurospora. Most of the diversity is down in these achinidial ones, and there are the glass Metzenberg Raju um, heterothallics down in the achinidial. And so I'm simple, gonna simplify that, a canidial clade, a couple of achinidial clades to finish this talk. And the reason I'm gonna talk about this, I'm gonna present some unpublished data from Chris Han Soden's thesis. He's my last PhD student. And uh, so the A clade is canidial heterothallic, the ones we all know. B is achinidial pseudo-homothallic and achinidial homothallic. And C is achinidial heterothallic. So if you make a little table, you'll see that neurospora can do everything in terms of canidia or no canidia and these three types of mating systems, except canidial homothallic. No one's seen those. So we'll start, oh, and Chris isolated 113 new strains. And the way you find a heterothallic achinidial from soil is you, and this is from this paper, you heat the soil to kill most of the fungi. You play them, and they shoot ascospores on the lid, and you pick those off, and you subculture them. If it makes a parathesium, it's a homothallic. If it doesn't make a parathesium, it's an achinidial heterothallic. Then you cross them to show that. So he got 113 new strains and, and sequenced 149 genomes. So I'll go through, first this is the canidial heterothallic clade, and these are not ones that, that uh, Chris sequenced. These had been worked on already by Pierre Gladieux, shown here with his, I believe then, go girlfriend, Joanne Clavel, now wife and mother of two of his children. And so that is in the discreter clade. These are canidial ones that we're familiar with. But also in this clade, Chris found canidial homothallic neurospora. So now we can complete that chart. Everything that any ascomycete can do, neurospora can do. So you can all quit working on your other fungi and just start to work on your neurospora. <laughs> the acanidial heterothallics behave like the canidial heterothallics. They separate into populations. There's a Montane population, Michigan and Colorado population, Alaska population. Um, nothing too surprising there. <laughs> the B clade has the achinidial homothallics and the achinidial pseudo-homothallics. I'm going to focus on the pseudo-homothallics. So you will remember that pseudo-homothallics, the ascospore is created such that nuclei of both mating type are in one ascospore. So it shouldn't have to find a mate. And you'll remember also that, that the heterothallic achinidial or canidial fungi are separated into populations. So you can separate Alaska from Colorado from Michigan. You can't in this population. I don't understand that. How does it get around like that? And the branches aren't very long. Does it disperse continually all the time? It doesn't have to find a mate. Maybe it makes it easier to disperse. I don't know. I can't explain it. You can look at, at its ability to recombine. And so um, earlier today, um, Tim James presented this. And so this is linkage decay. And basically, if, if the, the bar the, the fit where half of the decay has happened is lower, and the distance between the markers is shorter, so in other words, this log scale for LD decay, that's more recombining. So the blue ones are more recombining. The red ones, the, those are the homothallic, canidial and achinidial, they're more clone, okay? So where should this fungus go that has its mate in the ascospore? It doesn't have to outbreed at all. It's as recombining as the heterothallics. So now I am completely confused. It's got both nuclei in the ascospore. It shouldn't have to find a partner. Yet it clearly, it recombines, maybe not better, but as well as any heterothallic. 
and it's one population from Alaska to Colorado for, to Michigan. So I'm actually putting this out because we really don't understand this. I'm hoping somebody in the room can think about it. Now the problem is, the one person that I really want to talk to about this is Bob Metzenberg. He's the one guy who would really have some idea, but can't do that. So I'm hoping someone else can think about this. And this is a picture of Bob and Louise about the time that we recruited Louise to come to UC Berkeley, which was one of the great things from my college at Berkeley. Now, the tragedy of a talk like this is there are people who've been in your lab who did great things that you don't have time to talk about. And here they are, and four of them, I'm really embarrassed because they're at the meeting. And, so, <laughs> and I wish I could have talked about lichens or, uh, or ecology, well, lichens or ecology or AM fungi. But there is a, a core here, a fungal ecology group, and that's what we're doing now. We're doing um, environmental sampling and sequencing, uh, most recently now of uh, sorghum, fungi growing on sorghum plants. And so with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention. has been raised of questions, but I believe it's 6.30. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I would be happy to talk about that all night, but, but this, is, this is where I feel I should act like an airline attendant on your flight home and go, please look for the nearest exit. <laughs> okay. So you can grab John and Dan's pen and ask him a few questions. So this is a, a question about the gift. Oh, thank you very much. Signed by the office.